Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a big financial donation for San Diego's winter homeless shelter as it gets ready to open up for another season. And I'm Peggy Pico. Also coming up, an in-depth look at the impact of San Diego politicians leaving public positions for lucrative jobs in the private sector. Plus, after six years at sea, Scripps, institution of oceanography's research vessel, returns to San Diego. We'll explore the scientific treasures they've uncovered. And dragon boat racing is one of the most popular sports in the world. We're going to show you a very special team racing out on Mission Bay. And there's a familiar face on the crew. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... A generous corporate donation will cover about half the cost of running San Diego's winter homeless shelter this year. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr joins us now from the News Center. She has more on this story. So, Katie, how much is the donation and who does it come from? United Healthcare is donating $250,000 to go toward operating the temporary downtown winter homeless shelter. The shelter is located on the edge of Barrio Logan and is expected to serve about 800 people during the four months that it's open. Now, housing officials say the last count shows 6,300 homeless people living in San Diego, with many of them living in downtown. And about 18% of the city's homeless are veterans. So what are city leaders saying about the donation and the shelter this year? Well, Mayor-elect Bob Filner was on hand to accept the donation. As you mentioned, it will cover about half of the cost to run the temporary shelter this season. Filner said the city has to work on finding a lasting solution to homelessness. And along those lines, the city's first permanent homeless shelter is scheduled to finally open this March. United Healthcare has also contributed money to that project. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. A new report says more people are traveling on San Diego freeways. The San Diego Association of Government says freeway use increased 11 percent over the last year. Sandag says it's an indication of an improving economy. But on the downside, it also means more pollution. A Sandag economist says local leaders need to focus on smart growth and to encourage mass transit. Those extra drivers are paying a little less for gas right now. The average for a gallon of unleaded is $3.80 in San Diego County. It's the lowest price since late July. State regulators say they sold more than 23 million pollution permits last week. It was the first auction under California's cap-and-trade program, part of the state's effort to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Businesses are supposed to cut their emissions or buy permits from other companies to go over the cap. The permits went for just over $10 apiece, raising about $233 million. The program is being challenged by the State Chamber of Commerce. Opponents say it's an illegal tax, and they say it will hurt the state's economic recovery. Bus fares went up a bit today for some passengers. The cost of a Metropolitan Transit System day pass went up two bucks. Unless you have a Compass Pass, or rather card, those are available at MTS Transit Store and Albertsons. Transit officials say the cards will help them prevent fraud and counterfeiting of paper passes. The Marine Corps is getting ready to debut a new squadron of fighter pilots. They will fly the military's newest strike fighter jets, the F-35B. The first jets arrived at Marine Corps Air Station Yuma on Friday. The F-35B has been the subject of controversy. Members of the Senate Armed Services Committee say it's been rushed into service despite technical problems. The F-35 is the Pentagon's most expensive weapons program ever because of delays and cost overruns. The YMCA at Camp Pendleton is hoping families can find some space for new Marines at their Thanksgiving table. The Adopt-A-Marine program matches local families with pairs of Marines who've just graduated from boot camp and can't make it home for the holiday. The contact number is there on your screen, 760-385-4921.
Holiday shopping is expected to generate more sales this year than it did a year ago. The National Retail Federation predicts retailers will sell $586 billion worth of goods. Joining us to talk about the season is KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson. Eric, how will California retailers fare this year? Well, Duane, uh, stores around the state can expect to enjoy the benefits of an improving economic situation. But a marketing professor here at San Diego State University tells me they probably shouldn't expect to keep pace with the national predictions. Professor George Belt says California's labor market continues to lag a little bit behind. The state's unemployment rate is running, running higher than the national average, and that's going to cool the holiday season enthusiasm for buying gifts. Now, Belch does say if California keeps pace with that national prediction, most retailers will probably be very happy about that. Yeah, I bet. How important is the coming weekend for holiday sales? Black Friday, Great Thursday, Cyber Monday, you can pick your day and your number. They've all become important indicators for how the rest of the holiday season is going to perform. The National Retail Federation says their surveys show that about 147 million people say they expect to do some holiday shopping, if not buying, over the coming weekend. That's a lot of business, but it is down a couple of million from last year's prediction. One thing working in the favor of more business this year, the holiday shopping season itself is actually longer. Thanksgiving falls a few days earlier this year than most, and that gives stores extra time to meet their sales goals. And as you may know, some businesses make more than 60% of their year, yearly sales in the time between Christmas and New Year, or Thanksgiving and New Year's. So this is really a critical time of year for them. And some stores open actually uh, Thanksgiving Day. KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson. What's next for Republican Brian Bilbray once his term in Congress is up? Today on Midday Edition, he said he'll concentrate on his daughter's health. Brianna Bilbray is fighting melanoma. After I leave office, it will be January 15th, which is when my daughter's um, next uh, test goes through. And if she can be um, clear to cancer, this may be something we all look back at it. The new breakthrough with uh, genetically altered mm -hmm. cancer treatments that make uh, chemo obsolete and move us beyond that. And hopefully that'll be a step. Bill Bray conceded the race for the 52nd Congressional District last Friday. He says he will push for bipartisanship until he leaves office. Peggy Pico takes an in-depth look at the impact of several San Diego politicians leaving public office for lucrative jobs in the private sector and finds out why some say we need to pay them higher salaries. When longtime public servant City Council President Tony Young announced his plans to leave office halfway through his second term, there was speculation salary may have had something to do with his decision. In his new position as head of San Diego's American Red Cross, Young will more than double his $75,000 a year City Council salary. Joining me to talk about local politician salaries and why some say we need to pay them more is Joe Clover Dance, member of the San Diego Civil Service Commission. Joe, thanks for being here. Good to be here. How does our city council members and our mayor salaries compare to, let's say, the same jobs they would have with the, with the similar responsibilities in the public sector? The city's salary setting commission studies that very question every two years. And I was on that commission a couple of years ago, and then more recently this year. In both in both cases, the Salary Setting Commission found that the salaries are woefully below what they should be for comparable work in the private sector or even in the nonprofit sector. And, and when we're talking about private sector, we're talking about, you know, our uh, city council members and mayors handles a two to three billion dollar a year budget, 10,000 employees at least, correct? Correct. So mm -hmm. it's, it would be hard to find a comparison to that. It, you would have to look at a pretty large company. There are a few in San Diego, and there are a number of them in the country. Um, those, those salaries are quite a bit higher than $75,000 for the policymaking legislative function of the city council, and they're quite a bit higher than $100,000 for the mayor. How about compared to other uh, council members and mayors in cities uh, similar our size? The, as I recall, the Salary Setting Commission this year looked at uh, Los Angeles, uh, among others, and uh, I looked at a number of similar sized cities uh, to San Diego and found them quite a bit higher. I believe in, in Los Angeles it's, it's easily double what the city council members make here, for example. Well, $75,000 sounds like a lot to a lot of people. Um, 
why doesn't the commission just, why don't they just say, hey, we're going to vote ourselves something more? It, is it really that little? The city council, um, the city council has a, a political problem with raising its own salary. Um, 40 years ago or so, when the city charter was changed to put this salary setting process in place that we use today, uh, where it's reviewed every two years and the council has to vote to accept or reject the salary setting commission's recommendation. That's the process. When that was put in place 40 years ago, I, it probably made sense. It doesn't work today politically. Well, it doesn't work politically. And the other thing is that um, when it comes to, to the salary increases and the, and the comparisons, what sort of impact does that have on retention, on getting new people here? Is that what we're really looking at? Well, I think we've seen some examples of that in the last 10 days or so with, with um, local um, elected officials, um, some with quite a bit of experience. Tony Young. Tony Young leaving, actually, um, for a salary somewhere in the, in the area of triple what he was, has, has been making. Um, that's, that's a concern. You need to pay appropriate salaries to attract the talent pool you want for the kind of work you're doing. $75,000 is a lot for somebody who makes, say, $10 an hour. I understand that. But we don't have people who make $10 an hour running a $2.5 billion organization and making the kinds of decisions that have to be made. So attraction, retention. But what about the fact that a lot of people say, look, you're public servants. Shouldn't this be done as sort of a, um, you know, a goodwill gesture or altruism? I think that's, there's something to be said for that. I feel that way myself to some degree. But do you want your candidate pool constrained to only people who can afford to do that? Only people who have other sources of income or independent wealth? Or people whose experience may not yet have raised them to the $75,000 salary level? So it could sort of polarize, the low salaries could polarize people into either the very wealthy who can afford mm -hmm. to live on that or people who aren't experienced? Pe people who may not yet have the experience or the background or, or the education or some combination of that that is consistent with running a two and a half billion dollar operation. What's the solution to this? The, the solution is, is to address raising the salaries. Now, how do we get that done? Obviously, politically, it's, it's become impossible. For the last 10 years, the council has not voted to give itself a raise, even though the Salary Setting Commission has recommended every other year that it should. Um, this year, the Salary Setting Commission recommended something that I thought had some possibility, some potential. And that is that um, the, the council would be able to vote on a salary for the office, but it could not affect anyone who voted on that salary level. And so it would only affect future uh, incumbents in the offices of mayor or city council. And I thought that had merit. That may require a charter change. It may be able to be done by ordinance. All right. A few choices there. Uh, Joe Cloberdance, thanks so much for talking with us. Nice to be here. Thank you. California egg farmers are suing the state over a law regulating how they house their chickens. We recently told you about farmers' complaints over Proposition 2. They say the voter-approved law is too vague, and they say egg prices will go up if they can't get clarity on the rules. The suit was filed in Fresno on Friday. It's the third legal challenge to Prop 2. A special retirement ceremony was held today for a member of the San Diego Metro Arson Strike Team. For six years, Holly earned her keep by uh, sniffing and detecting accelerants arsonists used to set fires. That's 42 years in a dog's life. Holly's trainer, Captain Mike Merrican, is also stepping down after 30 years of service. The eight-year-old Labrador is one of a handful of dogs used by San Diego Fire and Rescue. Well, if you're a handler of a working dog, every single day you have to interact with that dog to keep their training up. Now, Holly is a play reward dog. In addition to clearly eating and enjoying being around firefighters and going out to emergency scenes, the hard work that she does detecting whether accelerants are present in an environment, she does out of the pure joy of play. That's her reward if she gets to play with a toy if she does her job well at the incident. Her trainer says Holly will enjoy retirement living just like any other dog. 
As we told you late last week, the research vessel Roger Revelle is back in San Diego after six years of exploring the sea. Peggy Pico tells us what experiments were done and why they're so important. During its six years at sea, the research vessel Roger Revelle spanned the globe from South Africa to Australia, the Indian Ocean, and the Eastern Seaboard. Here with details of their epic voyage are Bruce Applegate, Associate Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and Rosa Leon Zayas, Chief Scientist of the Tonga Trench Expedition aboard the Revelle. Thank you both for joining me. This you're is welcome. exciting. You're back in town. Yes. Yes. Bruce, you're in charge of ship operations. 86 research expeditions were carried out during this uh, during this time on the Revel, on the Revel. What kind of experiments did you do? Almost every kind you can think of putting on a ship. I mean, one of the, the, the great things about Scripps research vessels is that we really do everything. We're general purpose research vessels. So that means uh, things like looking at the biology of the oceans, the physics of the water, uh, what's going on under the under the ocean floor, looking at the geology and geophysics of the ocean floor and looking at the, the dynamics of the, the ocean-air interface and even looking up in the atmosphere for climate studies. We just saw a picture of the vessel right outside of a giant iceberg. I mean, are you taking samples from icebergs, from the seafloor, from the ocean? Where, where are you getting this, uh, the samples from? Well, wherever we can take them. It depends on what the objectives of the scientific party uh, are. And uh, the, the, the picture you're talking about was a, a really neat cruise that we did down right to the ice edge in Antarctica where we were looking at the physical properties of the water down there, and it's something that we do on a repeat basis, and it's one of the kinds of programs that we do to try to figure out what's changing about our planet. And how do you find out if it's changing? Well, you, you keep going and looking. You keep exploring. Yeah. Rosa, how long was the uh, Tonga Trench expedition, and what was your mission? It was about seven days long, I'm pretty sure. And the mission was the, to analyze and understand the microbial um, composition and uh, microbial properties of the deep, deep ocean, about nine kilometers down the water column. Nine kilometers. How long would it take to a analyze that kind of data? A long time. We got our samples and brought them back to San Diego right away and started analyzing the samples and the data, but this will take years to complete analysis. What do you hope to, to gather, at least from your mission? From my perspective, I would like to understand uh, what kinds of microbes are down there and what are they doing in their environment. All right, and Bruce, why is this uh, vessel in such high demand? She got to be on it for a week, but others are clamoring to get on board. Yeah, we stay really busy on our ships. This, this ship, the Ravel, we like to have it busy 300 days a year, which is a really aggressive tempo. And the reason it's so busy and the reason so many people want to use it is, is really it's because it's a highly capable ship. It's, it's one of the biggest ships in the academic research fleet. And it's uh, really sort of bristling with instrumentation, so uh, stuff that's built into the ship that allow you to sense the water and the, and the seabed. But also, it's designed so that scientists like Rosa, when they come to sea, they can quickly uh, turn the ship into whatever kind of floating laboratory they want, whether they're physicists or biologists. It's a big deal. They, they'll come and they'll install all their instruments. And uh, we try to make the ship a, a giant plug-and-play instrument. And, uh, it takes a lot of forethought like and planning. Plug and play laboratory. Exactly. Tell us about the, um, I understand there's a, a, a robotic arm, a first of its kind robotic arm getting put on uh, the ship. What is that? Well, one of the things we're doing while we have the opportunity here in San Diego, it's been six years since we've been here, is to do a lot of the, the, the kinds of maintenance and upgrades that uh, really are best done here in, on the West Coast and especially in San Diego. And this particular arm is really an articulating crane. Um, and, you know, one of the, the, the the things that we do a lot with our research vessels is deploy big, heavy instruments over the side and then down to the ocean bottom. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is use an articulating arm that, that will able, be able to pick things up and very carefully place them into the water. So what that allows us to do then is to, to work in more extreme sea states with, with heavier pieces of gear. So really extend our ability to work in heavy seas by using a, a really high-tech piece of equipment. All righty. Um, just very briefly, next step is Vietnam waters? It is. All yeah. right. Are you going to go back? Sadly, not this time, but hopefully one of the days. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll wait to hear what happens. Thanks. Thank you both so much for talking You're with welcome. us. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you.
I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, President Obama visits the Southeast Asian nation of Myanmar, the first sitting U.S. head of state to go there. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. It was another tough Sunday for Chargers fans with a 30 23 loss to the Denver Broncos. Denver now leads the Chargers in the AFC West by three games. This league is a tough, tough competitive league, and, and there's a lot of guys. I mean, there's no one who's ever played who's not been knocked down. There's no one who's ever played who's not had a bad play. Uh, there's no one who's ever played that's, that's not been beaten by a good football player. So uh, our guys respond, and uh, they know how hard it is to be successful in this league, and, and they take that approach and understand that everyone out there is giving their best. And if a guy isn't giving the best he can, we'll put someone in there who is. You know, they made the game-changing plays. And, um, you know, the only thing you can, you can – <clears throat> there's no consolation. Our objective is to win. But the only thing you can never question from our group is we're not, we're not ever going to quit. And there's no lack of effort. And we fight like crazy till the end. And um, we'll continue to do that throughout the rest of the year. Things won't be any easier next weekend for the Chargers. They'll play the Baltimore Ravens, who've lost only two games uh, all season. They play at home. Qualcomm on Sunday. Now, tomorrow, the Chargers will hold their 34th annual blood drive. It's said to be the biggest of its kind. Over the years, more than 65,000 pints of blood have been donated. It runs from 10 in the morning till 6 tomorrow at the Town and Country Convention Center in Mission Valley. It's not the Loch Ness Monster or your imagination. The beasts seen on Mission Bay lately are dragon boats. Peggy Pico shows us how dragon boat racing helps cancer patients in San Diego and throughout the world. A jagged tooth grin, fiery red tongue, and flaring nostrils. Clearly, Dragon 2 is ready to race in San Diego's Dragon Boat Festival on Mission Bay. Six, seven, eight, nine, okay? Purple jerseys set my team apart from about four dozen other college and corporate teams ready to race. Yeah. Push the tail down, lift the head up. Our 40-foot long and nearly 400-pound boat is hand-carried into the brisk water for our 500-meter race. It's on these cool boats that are very cute, <laughs> and um, there's 20 of us in a boat, and you work as a team, and everyone faces forward, so we call it paddling. All right, let's have a good race, girls! A pat on the head should bring us luck, says an ancient Chinese tradition that started with the first dragon boat race more than 2,000 years ago. Today, 50 million people worldwide are dragon boat racers, making it one of the most popular team sports in the world second only to soccer. World championships are held every two years. Go one, two, three, but you don't have to be an athlete to paddle with us. The only requirement to be on Team Survivor is to have cancer. I was breastfeeding my first daughter and uh, at about three months discovered, three months post uh, uh, delivery, I discovered a lump. I had lymphoma in uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma and it was in my throat. Get in power! Two, three, four! I joined after my last treatment for stage three breast cancer. Team Survivor San Diego is among 50 international survival dragon boat teams. Thank you. I actually found out about dragon boating because I didn't know anything about dragon boating um, until my dad sent me a clipping from a newspaper from Ireland. But really it is just a reflection on what the women have been through to get there. Canadian doctor Donald McKenzie started the first cancer survivor dragon boat team in 1996 after his revolutionary study found dragon boat paddling prevents swelling in the limb system, reduces surgical scars, and speeds recovery in women who've had mastectomies. Now, vigorous exercise is a standard recommendation for nearly all recovering cancer patients. Let it run! Nice job, you guys. And though we came in third today, we still celebrate being in the same boat of life as a team 
of survivors. Okay, we're going to push through this. Ain't nothing we can't do, okay? Nothing we can't do. There's very few people, unless they've walked in your shoes, can truly empathize. And it's just camaraderie, and it's going out and having fun together rather than wallowing around thinking, being, feeling sorry for yourself. This has showed me that, yes, you can recover, and yes, you can be strong, and other people are strong with you. Peggy Pico reporting. Team Survivor San Diego is a nonprofit organization. It provides free exercise activities, boat racing, yoga, and walking groups, and it's free to women in all stages of cancer and recovery. For more information, go to kpbs.org. Recapping tonight's top stories a financial donation for San Diego's temporary winter homeless shelter. United Healthcare gave $250,000 to help run the shelter. It's expected to open later this week, providing food and shelter for 800 people over four months. Today's donation covers half the cost of running the facility. A new report says more people are traveling on San Diego freeways. The San Diego Association of Government says freeway use increased 11 percent over the last year. Sandag says it's an indication of an improving economy, but on the downside, it also means more pollution. A Sandag economist says local leaders need to focus on smart growth and to encourage mass transit. Those extra drivers are paying a little less for gas right now. The average for a gallon of unleaded is now $3.80 in San Diego County. It's the lowest price since late July. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.